go, you'll see. Awesome. Hi, everybody. My name is Kim Kushner, and I serve as the assistant director. Well, let me fix my screen here. Of <laughs> assistant director of new student and family programs in our office of student involvement. Our office of student involvement is located within our division of student affairs. The division of student affairs uh, works with students for resources and programming and events and a lot of kind of the outside of the classroom experiences and opportunities. Um, but my role also, the last half of the new student and family gets to work with you all. And so also our student affairs division, as well as the rest of our university, are really dedicated to working with our parents, families, support systems. So we're so excited. Um, this is the first year that we have laid out a family week like we are. So having folks in this Lunch and Learn is really, really awesome. Um, UMKC Parent and Family Programs is a relatively newer uh, initiative on campus, and I'll be just talking about that momentarily. So we are just going to go through a couple quick slides, and then the way this will work is that Christy and I are going to have a conversation um, with some just some different questions that she and I um, are going to go over. You are more than welcome to use the chat or to you know ask a question. There's a good amount of us in here. We don't have to be super scripted, prescribed. You know, we're here to help you and here to um, hopefully offer some really awesome insight and perspective as we're heading into a really busy October during a year like no other. So um, hopefully you can see my slides. And um, again, parenting in the college years conversation. And Christy, like I said, will moment, Dr. Holsinger will momentarily introduce herself. And as I said before, uh, family week is already happening. It started yesterday. Um, in the past, we've done family weekend. And last year, we had almost 500 folks in, involved in family weekend. Um, with everything with COVID and with some different uh, needs of our families and students, we had decided to move to a virtual week because a weekend may just be a lot with being on Zoom 24-7 and to try to really connect as much as possible, knowing that many of you work or just have really demanding schedules. So we're really excited and you can go to go.umkc dot edu slash family week to learn more. Um, we have a really fun kangaroo drawing class tutorial today. You should join. I have no idea how to draw and I drew a pretty good looking kangaroo when we did it during the week of welcome. And then also just really cool things happening both um, live and uh, on demand throughout the week. And as I mentioned before, um, we also, UMKC Parent and Family Programs is the initiative that my role oversees. Um, it's been around our university now since around last year. We had always been doing some parent and family engagement through Family Weekend and really realized that parents, families, and supporters are vital to keeping our students well, whether that's the physically well, mentally well, doing well in their academics, doing well and thinking about their career career aspirations, you know, just kind of, you all are really important. There's some um, data out there that shows that on average, our parents and families are interacting with our students at least 13 times a week when they're not living right next to each other. But that means through texting, through maybe a message on, I don't know, I'm not very techno savvy, Facebook, Snapchat, um, through basic phone calls, et cetera. And so your students are really looking to you still with a lot of questions with a, hey, I'm not sure how to, you know, fix this in my residence hall room, or I am really struggling in my calculus class. You know, what do I do, mom, dad, family member? And so, you know, you're probably in a unique situation where you maybe were helping them a little bit more in the past. And, um, you know, Christy will talk about some of that today and some ways to really think about parenting during the college years. But my role, and I always kind of talk about this in different emails and different ways, is I am here and it brings joy to my life to help all of you in whatever way possible. Um, all you need to do is just email families at umkc.edu and I'll connect you to what you need because we want you to stay involved, get connected, and ultimately support your student um, here at UMKC and beyond as they become an active alum um, with our community. 
And we want you to be part of also our UMKC RU community. So you can learn more on the website there and I'll put it in the chat later on when we get started. I just wanted to note that this is kind of small, but we have so many different offices, departments, student organizations that are helping with Family Week, whether it's our Spanish department and Latinx Student Union help um, sponsoring our Zumba program, or our Diversion, Division of Diversity and Inclusion today um, hosting a program that we're helping to get the word out and invite you all with a conversation with the mayor of Kansas City or our Twain Miniatures. Um, if you didn't know, we have a, a museum on campus that is dedicated to Twain Miniatures. They put together some videos for you all to take a look at. So there's a lot going on and a lot of really awesome ways to connect. So, Enough of me talking. Again, continue to use the chat if anything comes up. If you want to even just introduce yourself in the chat, you're more than welcome. If you want to say your name um, and maybe where you're Zooming in from today. I know it's like normally you call her, you know, where you're calling in from, but we'll say where you're Zooming in from. Feel free to include. And now I'd like to allow um, Dr. Christy Holsinger to introduce herself and get the show on the road. Great, thanks so much, Kim, for, for all that information and introduction. And uh, great to see some parents here. Um, I'm glad that you were able to join us. And certainly, we would love to be doing this in person, um, but uh, ho we'll hope for next year um, with a different format. But right now, we're, we're being adaptable, as, as the students are as well, uh, to do our best to, to get through this, this challenging time. So I have been at UMKC since 1999. That's when I first came here for my first academic job. So it was very exciting, um, kind of interesting in that my, my spouse, Alex and I both came together and both were looking for academic jobs in the field of criminal justice and criminology. So we had been told by our advisors, our graduate advisors, good luck finding a place where you both get hired and you might have to commute. And we were really lucky because UMKC hired us both um, interviewed us both separately, hired us both, and so we both became faculty assistant professors in the Department of Criminal Justice and Criminology. And um, those early years were pretty <laughs> all-consuming in that we came here with three small kids in tow. Uh, the youngest was about um, two when we started uh, teaching here, and we had to be pretty focused on on both our careers and, and parenting this, this crew of, of young boys. So they were pretty demanding years where I was really focused on what I absolutely had to do, which meant that I didn't get out of the world of criminal justice very often and didn't know a lot about the larger workings of the university. So I did a lot of um, teaching and publishing in the area of correctional interventions, particularly for girls and women. Um, kind of became, uh, my area of expertise was around juvenile delinquency and mentoring programs. And um, so after a number of years, I was asked to be department chair, which kind of started me getting into more administrative roles. So after being chair for a bit, a few years, I was asked to be an associate dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. And, you know, so then I had to come up from the perspective of just thinking about one department to thinking about all the departments that are in the College of Arts and Sciences. And the College of Arts and Sciences is only one of 12 academic units. So you start getting a feel for how big this place is and, and how many different things are going on. It's, it's really still now in my new role as Senior Vice Provost for Student Success. I feel like I'm still learning so much about all the parts and aspects of this large organization. Um, so that's been just a lot of fun and invigorating to be learning new things. So that's a little bit about um, my time at UMKC. I've been in this new role, uh, Senior Vice Provost, since um, about the third week of, of February. So I got a couple regular weeks in before things went haywire. So um, that's about, that brings us here today, so. Oh, Kim, you're on mute. Yeah, I just realized that. Okay. Sorry, my, the way I, uh, <laughs> this is 
the fun of Zoom, my friends. The way I spotlighted, I realized I don't know how to unspotlight you. Uh, replace spotlight, there we go. Um, there we go. We're gonna learn Zoom as we go. Um, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate uh, the in that introduction. And again, folks, feel free to um, introduce yourselves in the chat or stop us at any point. Um, you can unmute yourself if you'd like and ask a question. Um, but um, I am going to just start with a few questions and we'll go from there. Um, in particular, I, um, Christy, you know, you just told us a little bit about your UMKC journey, which is wonderful. Um, but feel free to tell us just a little bit more about yourself and your family. Um, any details that make sense? Uh, I know we were just chatting right beforehand, even though just about all the boys. So yeah. feel free to share. <laughs> All the boys. So I uh, grew up in Michigan and I was um, in college there when I met Alex and he was yet, to, he was not in his 20s yet when I met him. So we met pretty young. I'm a little older than him, but we met pretty young. He was living with my brother and we just became very connected very quickly. And I left my job and started working where he was working. He left the college he was at and came to the college I was at. So we just, you know, became, um, there wasn't a lot of dating. We kind of just moved in pretty quickly together and started um, this life together. So we got married pretty early and um, had quit kids quite, quite young. Um, started having kids right away, although I, I can't say that they were all that planned. <laughs> um, so we had Jordan first, and I'll just tell you a little bit about where they're at now. Um, he is studying, uh, he's in his last year of his PhD program in political science at Florida State University. And he was the one who went away to college. Uh, he went to a small liberal arts school in Pennsylvania. He was part of IB in high school and really wanted that kind of small intimate college um, experience. So he's uh, getting close to graduation. And um, then Luke is, came to UMKC and he did a degree in studio art. And all the, all the boys are very different from each other. I know, you know, some people feel like, oh, the kids all kind of do the same thing. Mine all did very different things and had very different interests. So that um, another aspect of parenting that's interesting to think about, you know, different kinds of parenting, different kids need. But Luke was um, kind of more into the creative side of things, writing, um, uh, ended up being introduced to ceramics at UMKC and fell in love with that. He's also kind of a chef. So he works as a restaurant manager at the Savoy downtown and really is enjoying that and is able to do his art on the side. And then I have a son who is still at UMKC. He's a senior in the engineering program, one of our engineering programs. And so he, he tells me he'll be graduating in May. So <laughs> hopefully there's no surprises there. Um, so yeah, they're, they're just uh, all different areas of interest and, and very different from each other in a lot of ways, so. Thank you for sharing, thank you. Um, me, the way I'm spotlighting, it's not loving me today. There we go. Um, talk to me too um, about what your, so you talk a little bit about um, all of your boys are different and kind of all doing their individual adventure and journey and what does that look like um, and what's your approach to parenting looked like through letting them kind of choose their own adventure and have these different life experiences? Well I think kind of an interesting thing that set up Alex and I to be parents is that during the time we were having these young kids we were in school and so by the time we had two little kids we had started grad school and I think, you know, you think about, I don't know how common this is, but for me, there was just this fear. Like I have these little human beings I'm responsible for. And um, like you think of the worst possible outcomes, like them being juvenile delinquents or going to prison or being drug addicts. Like that was in my mind. And I thought how interesting that at this time, I am reading all of this literature on theories of delinquency um, the importance uh, and how parenting factors into that and how good parenting matters and makes a difference and a lot of research that shows that. 
um, also studying about corrections and philosophies of punishment and how you create behavioral change in people like behavior modification programs and how you help people change so i felt alex and i used to joke because we would read these things and talk about how we could apply them to parenting this this young crew of boys and we would joke that we were going to write a book someday called how to not raise a juvenile delinquent but then we felt like we better wait till they were all in their late 20s before we you know made such a claim that we hadn't raised any juvenile delinquents but um it really it was interesting because it's just like that literature really informed us and i think that was just kind of a, a interesting thing to have happened when we were um when we were you know in this field of study so one of the things i remember seeing that had a big impact on how i parented and this is something that got developed by uh, Baumrind in the 1960s uh, Diana Baumrein, and then was further developed by a couple other researchers in the 80s, but it basically looks like at these dimensions of parenting. So one dimension of parenting is responsiveness. I think of it as how connected you are and what's the level of intimacy in the relationship. So for example, you can be a very warm parent, that's one way to describe it, where you show a lot of affection and care, there seems to be a lot of connection. These are parents who seem to enjoy the company of their children um, and, and seem, seem connected with them um, and, and supportive of them. Cold parenting, on the other hand, is more indifferent, uh, detached, uh, more hands-off, um, probably less enjoyment of being a parent. So it's not really hard to guess which of those is the better option in terms of raising children. But the other dimension is a little bit more complicated. And that dimension is um, kind of the level of expectations and demands that you put on kids. So you can either be really strict or really permissive. Now, none, neither of those is clear cut good or bad, right? Because you think of the worst case of being strict and that can be real punishment oriented, um, kind of having a dictator approach to your kids um, can be kind of antagonistic and demanding. Um, but, you know, permissive doesn't sound that good either. I mean, that's like, you know, really not, um, maybe being lenient, being inconsistent, uh, being overindulgent would all be things we think about with that. So the, the real goal is to figure out how to have high expectations um, and so that you do have these clear rules and um, uh, with consequences, you know, and so this is really seen as more the ideal when you have those kind of expectations and consistent and firm uh, enforcement of those, uh, that is where you get kind of the best parenting outcomes. And so that pairs with being warm. So being warm and having these higher expectations of your kids is where you get higher academic performance again from the research higher self-esteem better mental health um, better social skills um, because if you can imagine if you combine um, that level of expectation with cold you get like captain von trapp from <laughs> the sound of music that's who i think of you know the rule guy um, who's always, uh, he's not warm. No, he's not warm, but he has really high expectations for these kids. And it's, it's, there's a lot of punishment and a lot of way that he's in charge and no one else has any kind of say. So that's a type of parenting that kind of authoritarian where you have cold and very strict, which is again, here you have kids that um, don't really internalize a lot of the skills that they need to know. They're just trying to avoid punishment and getting caught. Um, so then, then another kind of parenting would be uh, real indulgent, where you're very connected, there's that warmth, but also permissive. And uh, I think that's kind of a parenting style that um, probably is more, um, some of these parenting styles kind of swing back and forth the pendulum. Like if you were raised in a really strict environment, you might you know, become a much more permissive parent, just in reaction to kind of what your experience was. Um, so anyways, that's not a, not a great combination either. It's kind of the indulgent parent, the permissive parent. And then the, the, the another, another type where you get these combinations is cold and permissive. And that's, that's 
really high in raising a juvenile delinquent because that's neglectful, right? That's a parent who's not connected and is also not paying much attention to the kids. So I, the ideal again is high demands, high emotional connection and responsiveness. And that type of parenting is called authoritative, not authoritarian, but authoritative. And that's seen as kind of the ideal. Um, the other thing, so that, that whole parenting scheme was often in my mind and like, how do I be connected and have you know, reasonable expectations and um, have some um, you know, very clear rules and consequences that, that get followed through on. The other thing that was interesting to me is thinking about how to change behavior, how, how you, um, in, encourage good behavior and eliminate bad behavior because that's a lot of the, the work around correctional programs again for adults but you know they would say things like you've got to communicate those expectations really clearly never ignore bad behavior and, and respond to it so there are all these things that kind of made sense about what you would do and and, and to do and you know, to respond without emotion because a lot of times if you're responding out of proportion it's because you're really angry um, at something that your your kid has done. So just be really careful that you're responding uh, succinctly without a lot of emotion and not disproportionately to what's happened. But the thing that really stood out in this literature is that the suggestion is, is that you offer six encouragements of and, and positives for every negative. Okay, so that it can't be all about punishment to change behavior. It has to be about recognizing when people are displaying the behaviors and attitudes you want. Well, I can tell you that is a real challenge as a parent, because when do you intervene? When the kids are screaming at each other, right? And so I started, we started trying to be really intentional and it sounds goofy, but like walking through the room going, look at you two, I really like the way that you're playing together. And just to recognize every time that we saw good manners and celebrating that and just really focusing on the good um, rather than always honing in just when you see the, the bad behavior. And um, I, yeah, I, I think that's a, that's was really felt at the time re revolutionary for me to, um, because I think I had parents who only kind of commented or got involved if I was falling short of expectations, but there wasn't a lot of um, saying, wow, I'm, I'm really proud of you or, or the way that you're behaving. That translates to me, at least. I've got a toddler who also six times a day, maybe a little, some transferable things with a toddler, with a college students, et cetera. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, we have a question actually in the chat as a follow-up on that. Um, how would you balance the warm concept with a child who doesn't accept that? Hence the difference between, um, between their children. Yeah. Um... I, I guess I'd have to know a little bit more about what that not accepting it looks like um, and the age. I mean, I think that, that there are certain ages that kids go through where they're looking for a little bit more distance. And maybe it's just thinking through ways to how do I connect with that kid and show my engagement. I'll give you a good example. Uh, my oldest two were real um, snuggly type kids. I mean, they were they were physically, you know, like happy to be sitting on my lap and spending time with me in that way. And the youngest is a bit of a live wire. And um, so even as they grew up, I, I could go out for lunch with the older two or go out for coffee with the older two. And they were really easy to engage with and talk to. And I just felt like that was missing in the relationship with the youngest son, Eli. So I, I we thought about it a lot. We talked about it and it, what we found to be the answer is this is a kid who doesn't like to sit and talk. And so it was me going out and playing tennis with him or me going out and throwing the ball with him or doing, going on a run or going on a bike ride. And it was in that context of us like doing something physical together or doing a project together that then he would open up and we'd have kind of more of a connection, uh, which seemed to just come easier with the, the other two. 
that reminds me a little bit of like love languages, like figuring out if they're like words of affirmation or quality time. Gosh, what are they all putting on the spot? Physical touch, um, acts of service, I'm probably missing. Oh, and gifts. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying really resonates too, um, because maybe it's just like uh, figuring out for your students, for your children, like that time, it looks, sounds like quality time to just like unwind and be physical is really what worked for your son. So yeah. that's fantastic. Um, how has that uh, approach changed maybe as they've now been in their 20s? Some of them are not living at home. So um, what does that look like and how does that translate to the college experience? None of them are living at home, which is wonderful for my work life. <laughs> Because I see people who aren't having that right now, and that's it's tough. Um, so there are things I've still really maintained. I would say I I really and and again I think a lot of times we parent out of reaction to what we experienced and how we wanted things to be different maybe. And so for me, I I really have tried to remember how important it is that they hear affirmation, that they hear that I'm proud of them, that that I'm. Um, you know, reinforcing the good things that I see, just like I did when they were little. Uh, the tricky part is I have, I found parenting to be easier when you had all the control. I will not deny it. And even in the high school years, I, we had conversations like, how are we going to do this and transition from being the bosses to having friendships with young adults? And so that took some conscious choices on our part in those high school years of letting things go, of talking things through, but, but saying, you know, that's your decision to make and started giving away some of that, us setting the expectation, us having the control. And, and so we, we did try to let go of that. Um, I will say that the high school years went so much better than I thought they would. And the college years went a lot worse than I thought they would. And, Worse in the sense that I feel like a lot of the, the crisis that hit them, hit them more in college. You know, the very close friend that's sexually assaulted, the very close friend that attempts a suicide, you know, just some of those more adult, terrible themes, you know, that, that those happened more in their college years. And they were, that was a real struggle to, to see them through those, those hard times and be there for them because that was just, um, you know, pretty, pretty difficult stuff to, to get through. I think another interesting thing about uh, that transition for me was I made a big mistake of ass assuming that the experience I had going from a high school and then away to college would be the same for them because I loved college. I hated high school. I loved college. And I'm like, they're going to love it. I, re I remember just feeling like intoxicating freedom from being out from under my parents. Well, the kids, our kids did not react that way. They were, they had a lot harder time leaving. They seemed happier to be just staying at home and not, you know, moving forward into these more independent lives we had envisioned. So that was, that was just kind of a, a an interesting thing. And, um, you know, I probably shouldn't have sold it as, you know, college will be the best time of your life. Cause they're like, what are you talking about? It's not. <laughs> so I think it was just more difficult for them. Um, I think now that they're older and have gotten through that transition, it's, you know, we're back to things feeling great again. But um, I think that was, that was harder for them and that, that caught me um, by surprise. Thank you. Yeah, it can be definitely mixed and it, I'm sure it's a struggle just to figure out day by day, even sometimes how to care for and, um, empathize and or say like here's your resource I'm not going to do this for you but here's maybe a way to guide um how at like just at UMKC based on kind of what you learned from your own family um in parenting how can parents and families best support their college student here um at our university and you know what are some things that resonate with you in terms of you know the must share uh mm -hmm. topic areas there yeah, I would, I would say just staying connected, um, com communicating that you have confidence in them, that you trust them, um, you know, that they, that they have the, 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 the smarts and the, the, you know, they know what they, they need and just to encourage them. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think we continue to be really involved and supportive in that way, but really, and it's not always easy, but refraining from putting my input on everything, right? <laughs> I know they care what we think, and it's really easy to do that. And so I'm very uh, probably more cautious about that than anything when I relate to them is just that, um, that they're quick to hear things I say as judgment and just realize that and kind of the power in that um, and, and to not misuse that <laughs> and to let them um, kind of develop as their own people and be supportive of that. Yeah, one of the things I would add, first of all, Kim and, and Christy, both thanks for all your contributions. I think it's a great discussion. Um, one thing I would add to what Christy said is that, um, you know, I try to focus, it, I think when my son last year was in high school, you know, we were definitely focused on grades and sort of academic outcomes being indicative of, you know, what his college options may or may not be based on those, right? His SAT scores. And, you know, it was very much, it felt looking back, it feels like I, I was driving the car maybe by looking out the rearview mirror. And, and I don't know that I was doing that the right way or because I found it challenging this year so far when he's at UMKC, when I have talked to him to say, I, I'm not going to ask you about your grades. I'm going to ask you about the course and the content and, and the academic journey that you're going on, which is going to be very, very different. He came from a very small school, so now he's in a very big pond, right? So, um, you know, I'm, I, I tend to focus more now on just asking him about what he's taking away from the experience rather than the grade. In the end, I don't really, his, his academic performance, he's got to own and he's got to really do that. But you know, I, I, I do find it easier to connect with him and maybe other parents can too, but I guess my big uh, advocation would be, you know, try to find the intellectual interest that he has because he's still trying to find his way and what path that's going to be. And, you know, he, he, he was at the kitchen table the other day, um, just kind of reconnecting on an economics course that he was taking and he tried to, I think he was trying to draw, draw a regression graph or something and and, and he didn't quite get it, but it, it's, it was cool to see those wheels moving, right? And I found that to be a better connection rather than what test score he got or something like that. So mm -hmm. it's my two cents. No, it's great. I love that. It's a great point. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Again, if anybody, um, feel free. Um, Zoom is hard to have like a conversation, but I really appreciate um, that feedback because it is, it's thinking about uh, what Christy had talked about with just those words of, again, those words of encouragement that I'm proud of you, being genuine about that, um, you know, and being thoughtful about when that can happen, but helping them through their journey, because you're right, there are these little touch points of, yes, they're going to get fall semester grades, and they're going to hopefully get, you know, midterm score in the process, and there's these kind of, you know, I guess maybe not touch points, but checklist items that will inevitably happen, but then what are some of those long-term ways you can think about your approach to helping them through yeah. those checklists, but also just in their educational journey, building what I always like to call and that my students kind of joke with me about like transferable skills, you know, thinking about what they're learning in the classroom, what they're learning outside of the classroom and asking them questions about how they're using those skills beyond just, I'm, I'm, I'm studying for the grade. I'm studying for the grade. Okay, well, you know, if you're interested in business, have you thought about service learning in the community and or an internship? Have you thought about, you know, a lot of those have you thought about maybe approach or not so much like, oh, I did this, so you should do this, but those kind of, have you thought about or have you asked about or, you know, did you, you know, just some of that kind of stuff really comes to mind too. So I really appreciate you sharing yeah. that approach. And, and Kim, that really taps into another, I think, an important idea that it has been for me is just, I'm a problem solver. And it's easy for me to jump in and solve problems, but to constantly remind myself that it, that's not my job anymore, like it was for them. It's, it's the conversation of, wow, that sounds tough. What are you thinking? Well, what would be the, you know, the benefits or the consequences of if you took that path and to just more ask them questions that help them think through it rather than do that thinking for them and knowing that that has to come from their perspective to work in terms of how they problem solve and think through it. So 
I think what you just said too with the validation piece, like really validating whatever feeling is coming to mind for that for your student, because you might be like, what, why are you thinking that? Like, ugh. like yeah. in the back of your mind, but your student is in their space and is feeling the feels and just needs that validation. A lot of times I know um, even just thinking about working with other college students, sometimes I come across and say some things and I'm like, oh, let's go a different direction, but I'm going to leave them and give them a moment just to validate what's going on and to kind of hear and probe a little bit more. And then this brings a great question um, into kind of thinking about in this space now, like it's October. So for some of our students, this might be the first time they're really starting to work through, oh my gosh, I don't know how to get academic support or I am in a virtual space and this is completely new to me. And so how can a parent or family encourage or family member encourage their students to kind of seek that help instead of maybe being full speed ahead, the problem solver in that situation? Yep. Well, it, it was interesting because I, I did quite a, uh, quite a few student forums where we listened to students over the summer and it was fascinating to hear from the ones who are here doing well, having a good experience, and all of them talk about the resources at UMKC that they're utilizing. So my biggest concern, so I know we've got some really great resources in place here. My concern is the students who are not doing well and who are not utilizing those services and feeling like they, they can't make it, they're failing, um, when in reality, and it's a, it's a hard thing to want to do, but to, to reach out to the professor, to go to the tutoring services or writing studio or doing the supplemental instruction um, work that goes along with many of our high, um, high fail classes, you know, classes that students are, are more likely to struggle in. So um, I think it's to, you know, when they come to you with the problem of struggling, it's just reminding them that there are so many resources and so many people who it's their job. You know, they're paid to be here and to help you succeed and to just encourage them to utilize those resources. Um, and, you know, sometimes you can help, but a lot of times you can't. I remember my son came to me when, and he was, he was really struggling with depression and I just, he wanted, he wanted my advice. And I, I just said, you know, I have to be really honest with you. That's not something I've experienced before. Um, and I care deeply, but I'm not going to be the one who's going to be able to help you through this. But <laughs> there are people who are, and there are people who study this and know how the best way to help um, people like you who are going through this as young adults. And, and, and eventually that's what he did. Um, but you know, it's like, it's, 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 it's on them, you know, to take that next step, whatever it is to, to, to get the help that they need. And that's not always easy, but I think we've just got to, you know, keep encouraging them to do that um, because that, that really can make such a huge difference. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I can imagine that it can be heartbreaking not to be able to, you know, snap a finger and put a, you know, figurative band-aid on a situation that's happening. So I appreciate you sharing and kind of being vulnerable with our folks here too, to recognize that that happens in lots of our families, depression, thinking about um, just getting counseling and support and really letting our students know that UMKC and the Kansas City community has some different resources there. And it can be really heartbreaking for families when they can't you know, take them to a counseling session or set it up for them due to just even some privacy things and whatnot. So, um, or the preferences of the student at that time. Um, mm -hmm. So that piece of where you all also come in, in that kind of later stage of, or new stage for many of you of being that sounding board, but not being sometimes that trained counselor to like really know how to set up an intervention and set everything up, but just be, you know, mom, dad, family member to just listen and to hear them. So, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, does anybody have, we have a couple more questions we can answer, but um, if anybody has questions, you feel free to unmute yourself or to uh, put your speak or put your video on or use the chat. We'd love to hear any of you all or any comments about anything um, that anybody said so far. We'd love to open it up. I would just add, uh, sorry to, if anybody else has anything, but uh, just 
make sure you encourage them to fail too, right? It's, it's okay if they struggle, that's where they're going to fall forward and hopefully learn. I found myself talking to my son this morning as we were driving to Lee Summit to pick up his car, uh, really just to, to embrace adversity and embrace this whole COVID narrative that's out there. I mean, these kids are bombarded with, with um, I say kids, these young men and women are, are bombarded with, you know, the, the, the media messages from Facebook to, to CNN and everything in between. And it's really, really easy to get uh, consumed by that. And, you know, I, I just, I, I would just encourage everybody, you know, because I, I can see some of the parent, parent forums too, um, where people are kind of commenting and a lot of it's just connecting, I think. You know, we all look back on our, at least I do anyway, the rite of passage freshman year experience that I had going to K-State um, is definitely not the same experience this year. Um, and that's nobody's fault. That's just the adversity of the era. And I think this generation, those that are attending now are, are, are very well equipped to get through this. They've got tools that, that were, you know, not even considered when, when our generation was, would have gone through this. So I do think this adversity, while it is challenging, it doesn't have to define them in the moment. I think they can, you know, hopefully I, I would just encourage you to remind them that they have the power to define this moment, just like generations before them have done with, you know, everything from civil rights to, to voting rights to suffrage to everything in between. And so I, I just, I really think that's important because I think a lot of, especially the recluse kids that maybe don't have, you know, the network around them to really encourage them that mindset that it's, it's all perspective and how they get through this really, in my opinion. That was really well stated, Sean. We, we need to put you on the panel this <laughs> time. <laughs> I think that that reframe and like refocus yeah. of some of that energy and to, it, you can feel really helpless in it and you can yeah. feel our students, your, your kids can feel like uh, even sometimes, so there's so much going on in the yeah. virtual world or there's or there's so many, there's different resources and where do I even start? And I don't, I think even in the chat, it says like, I don't have time for counseling or counseling is not for me, or I don't have time for tutoring or I don't have time for X, Y, Z organization. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, I, I, uh, I taught my son how to ride a bicycle. I remember getting him a helmet and the elbow pads and the training wheels. And, you know, eventually I had to let go as a parent. Uh, eventually, you know, he would fall and he would scrape his knees and hit his elbow, whatever he did. And I think that's kind of the metaphor for what they're going through right now. We all got to kind of let go and let them go through this just like everything else. And, you know, the sky's not falling. The sun will rise tomorrow. We will get through this time. And, you know, I just, I, I just want to encourage him kind of like I did with that bike. And I just got to keep, you know, the media out of my ear too, because it's, it's easily um, impacting my mindset too. And, and, I would just say the best thing for, you know, you know, I guess the, the takeaway that I got from, from this is just to, uh, to just encourage their confidence and leverage resources that are there because those same resources were there when I was in school when you guys were obviously in school too. Um, and, and I think that's important reminders for all of us parents right now. So if that is the only takeaway from this, I think it's well, well put. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I love that feedback and just I'm glad that to share that you're sharing that takeaway. Yeah. Um, I, I want to address a um, question in the chat because I think it relates also to what you were saying, Sean, and what Christy and others have kind of said in the chat. So how do we help our students when they say, I don't have time for, in this example, counseling or counseling is not for me or I don't have time to go to the gym or I don't have time to get to talk to my advisor or to eat lunch today or, you know, just or to X, Y, Z. Um, what comes up for folks? Chrissy, anything for you first? And then we can kind of open it up as maybe thinking about some ways to support our students with that question. Sure. Um I think that that a comment like that would prompt me to have a conversation about with, with one of my kids about how um, you get to set your priorities and what, what do you really need to be successful? And you've got to think that through and make those decisions. And if, if counseling is really not, you know, something you're going to prioritize and think you can function well without, that's a choice that you're going to make. Um, but you know, we all make choices about how we spend time, how we spend money. So we all have those, we have those things and we have control over how we, uh, you know, choose to, to do that. So just 
just rather than saying, I, I just think it's easy. It's an easy thing to say, I don't have time, but you have time for the things that you decide are important to you. Just missing one word. You don't have time not to get counseling. You don't have time not to make it a priority to eat or not to make it a priority to go to the gym. If, and I yeah. think sometimes you need to reframe it that way because if you don't have time to go to the gym, then you clearly have time for sickness and illness and wellness issues later in life, right? So yeah. you, do, you do it the easy way or the hard way. You just gotta, I think as a parent, you have to, it's really important you have to, to give them that hard truth sometimes. Um, and, and I like the word reframing because I think that's exactly what you have to do, especially with kids, yeah. with young adults. I got to force myself not saying kids anymore. My son tells me that all the time. <laughs> yeah. and, and this is probably my version of, you know, I walked a mile in the snow to get to school every day or whatever. But I, I have frequently said to the kids, everything really great that I have in my life took an incredible amount of work. Um, and back to what I prioritized and, and you know, um, I don't think there's anything particularly easy about achieving a good marriage, a great family life, a great career. Like those are all things that take a great deal of work and effort. And, you know, again, you need to make decisions about what really matters to you and, and put your time into those areas. So again, that kind of puts the, the, the burden back on them to, to make those decisions. And in terms of like kids getting involved with things, you know, I, I think it depends a lot on the kid. I, you know, I have one kid that's a joiner. He just joins everything and he's super happy and others who are real resistant to that, you know, and so partly there's going to be just differences in kids and how they, how they respond to opportunities and, um, you know, engagement on campus. Because we definitely have some who just, you know, get so into it and others who are just, you know, not that interested, but. That's a good point. It's not what you do. It's not what you do for them. It's what you taught them to do for themselves. It's really going to leave the footprint, I think, yeah. in their life. Yeah. That's so true. Reality. And sometimes it's framing um, when it comes to involvement or thinking about the parent family supporter role of um, thinking about the future of like what is again, I go back to what is the skill you might need for to be a teacher. Oh, okay. Is there a group you can join that'll help you with that or to help you, um, you know, build some resources if you're interested in staying in the Kansas City area or staying in Missouri? Or are you interested in, you played a lot of video games in high school? Like, awesome. Did you know there's probably a video game organization for you and you can just get some fun and gain some social skills? Or um, we've got a lot of school of medicine related and nursing related organizations and pre-professional things. So I think it's just kind of figuring out too with your student um, what they like, what they're passionate about. Passion actually is a scary word sometimes for me, um, but also sometimes for students, but what, what makes them tick and trying to just say, have you looked into it? Does something exist on this campus that you know can allow you to um, you know, make some friends and find some folks who can help you with career or help you with your wellness or help you with that. And sometimes just, again, probing a little bit can make all the difference, but you're not necessarily, you then joining them and, you know, attending, making them attend the meeting. You know, there's not, there's only so much management of that you can do, I think, with college students. So, um, any other questions or thoughts um, to put in the chat? We want to just put it out there for folks. We're so thankful um, for this conversation. Awesome. Christy, I'll ask you just a kind of fun question here. What's uh, one of your favorite campus traditions that every student and family member should know about? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> sadly, we're not having it this year because of COVID, but hopefully next year. Um, I, ever since I started attending UMKC's International Culture Night, that is something I will never again miss. Um, it is pretty fabulous, and I think it's so good for our um, students, domestic students, to learn more about the, the international students that come to UMKC. They really make 
this campus a richer, more interesting place. Um, I just love, you know, as a, as a teacher, the more diverse my class was, the happier I was because I knew I'd get so many interesting perspectives on the topics that we would talk about and not everybody would you know, be thinking the same. Um, and so the, the culture night starts with um, booths and students from all different countries have a competition in decorating their booth in a way that shares their culture. Um, and uh, where they're from. And so they have maps and they, they, they it talk to students and faculty and administrators as they walk through. And then they also um, provide a lot of food, um, um, traditional food from their culture. So there's big uh, buffet out with food and, and whatnot. And then after that, there's a talent show. And I have been such a big fan that I keep attending and now I've worked my way into being a judge. <laughs> I was a judge of the booth last year, and this year I, I was going to be a judge of the talent show. So I really hope they keep my name and number for doing it in the, um, hopefully in 21, because it's, it is the coolest event. And so the, this, you know, the musical performances, the dance performances um, were just stunning, you know, and people wearing the traditional clothes of their country. Um, it was just really beautiful. And just the way that they all come together. Um, and unified as Yom Casey students and celebrate that, I think is just, it's just the ultimate feel good <laughs> night of the, uh, of the school year for me. So, but hopefully we'll get back to doing that soon. And, and who knows, maybe they're planning some sort of virtual celebration of that too. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. I, it's, I haven't been able to attend myself. I've been here for about a little over four years, but I have heard the hype around it. It's always fun to be a judge for those types of things. I was helpful. One of my favorite traditions at UMKC is court warming, which is essentially kind of a homecoming-esque basketball um, tradition where a lot of our student organizations, they also do like a, yeah, it's called Yell Like Hell, which is a talent show and some other things. So when you said the judge thing, I was like, yep. So we, Another thing I'll mention that I think has been great, and again, this has to come back soon, but um, we uh, just recently got into going to uh, some of the athletic events, women's basketball. I mean, they, they were champs last year, and so it was just a blast to go to the games and follow them. And our uh, relatively new athletic director has done a lot to add school spirit and energy and really cool activities into these games. And... Um, yeah, I, I started doing that like about maybe two years ago. And that's just been a really fun kind of, you know, UMKC community building experience and, and something that your students can do without charge and, and nothing against men's basketball. They're fun to watch too, but I just got really into supporting the women's team because they had some really fantastic fun to watch players. So, and did really well this past year. So again, all things that we're hoping are just come back so soon. Definitely. It's funny you say that. I have a meeting with our marketing person from athletics in just a few minutes from now. So maybe I'll have some updates. Um, well, we are about at the one o'clock time frame, at least for us. So I want to be mindful that maybe many of y'all might be on a lunch break or um, an hour of hearing Christy and myself is probably maybe all you need, although we could talk for hours and hours. Um, and thank you, um, Sean. Thank you others for asking questions and for really, you know, we want to build community for our families. Similar to our students, it's really helpful when you have a peer-to-peer, -peer, when students can support each other. And we're really trying to build that too here at UMKC through Family Week, through having Christy here, who is a family member, who is one of us in terms of just, you know, not just some administrator at the top who, you know, not saying does, who very much cares about you. So she does and wants to help you and wants to, and I'll let her obviously say that, not me, but you know, we're all, we're all here for you and we want to connect our families to each other where they can learn and grow from each other, set up ride shares, you know, do lots of different things. And so we're hoping to build that through this week and through um, having you here. I'll let Christy uh, conclude as well. Anything else we're sharing? Sorry, I didn't mean to speak for you there. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you for some of the appreciation being expressed in the chat. That's very nice. Um, so I, I want to remind you of my, my title. It is Senior Vice Provost for Student Success. That means when you all 
see your students hitting barriers related to student success and they are stumped and they are not sure what their next move is, I hope that you will consider me a resource and some, I, I have no problem with you sharing um, my email address um, with your student and saying, hey, this is her job. This is what she does. Why don't you talk to her and see if she has any ideas for addressing whatever challenge or whatever barrier they're experiencing. And, and I'm really happy to do that. So um, I am at your disposal and I am definitely at your children's disposal as well. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you know, we hate it when it happens, but sometimes if you're having problems getting response from someone, reach out to me and say, hey, it's kind of weird. I haven't heard from back from this person because that's, that's not the kind of place we want to be. That's not the kind of institution we want to be. We want to be very responsive and um, very um, as helpful as we can be. So um, any, anytime something's not working, not going quite right, let me know. Um, I'm, in, I'm now in a position where I can help rectify it. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so, happy to uh, do that. <laughs> Tracy, I got just something to add real quick. So we have a kid that, uh, young, a young man that was also a freshman in my son's class in high school. We found out yesterday that he had dropped out of UMKC and I'm not, I, I haven't dug into that and found out why. Would that be a referral that we could make to you as well? Absolutely. Okay. I and mean, I'd be happy to reach out. I think, yeah. I think he was the class uh, valedictorian. I mean, he's just a bright kid. I, I don't understand what happened. I was, my wife and I both were very shocked. And so, you know, I don't feel it my place to maybe dig into that garden, but, but, but I'll certainly share that with you privately. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, feel free to just shoot me an email. It's okay. Pulsinger K at umkc.edu. So my last okay. name and then the letter K. Uh, and I stuck, yep. Oh, sorry, sorry, Christy. I, I stuck um, the email in the chat too, so you can see that. Oh, you did. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, the worst thing is anybody coming here and putting in time and resources and not finishing. I mean, that's just, that's, that's terrible. That's not what we want. And when we accept your student, they're part of our family and we want to see them succeed. That is our primary goal. And, and I need to know about um, barriers they hit because I'm, I'm in a position to help with some of those and help yeah. address them. So please, um, yeah. Okay, sounds good, thank you. I look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you everyone. It was lovely to spend my lunch hour with you. And I yes. hope you have a great rest of the week. Go enjoy yourselves. Thank you. And we'll hopefully see you at future events. Thank you again. All Thanks right, bye-bye. <laughs>